And, and thank you for being here. Um, so let me know if, I hope everyone can hear me okay. I usually talk pretty loud. Uh, actually the first in-person talk I've done in like a year and a half. So uh, hopefully I'm not too rusty. Um, but, but what I thought is I'd um, show a few um, projects and kind of talk a bit about my process. Um, and then um, I have at the end a, a short video too. But um, I'll just jump into right now um, this is a, a project I had done for Sculpture Center in New York, and it kind of is representative of a lot of, um, this is maybe about, oh, uh, eight years ago now, and it kind of represents a lot of the work that I was making at the time. I was really interested in sort of um, collecting um, and accumulating materials and building these kind of archives, but I was thinking a lot about um, archives without an index, meaning like sort of, you know, it's like if you have a, library but no catalog or um, titles on the book. So I was really interested in these ideas that it's a collection, but it's kind of indeterminate what the collection is of. Uh, but I would source all these numerous spaces. I would source um, things I find on the street, things I make in the studio, um, things that I, I, I collect as I travel. And one of the places I was really interested in was um, my childhood home in New Jersey. Because uh, I grew up in this very suburban home and when I was a teenager, my parents moved. And the house I grew up in was like very 80s and 90s. It had like fake brick paneling and bad carpeting and like tchotchkes everywhere. And I don't know what happened, but my parents moved in, in the 90s. Uh, me, I was a, as a teenager, me with, with them. And the new home was just like 16 foot white walls, blank, with like one Japanese coffee table in the corner. And I was like, what happened? And my mom's like, oh, this is like, this is what, we're gonna live like this now? And I'm like, okay. And so everything from our lives just got shoved into the basement. And the basement was this also kind of very strange, unusual archive of materials of our past, um, things that they didn't want to throw away, but they also had no use of. So these kind of weird, indeterminate objects. So one of the things I started doing was, pulling a lot of these materials from the basement, using them in my installations, and then after that, disposing of the material. So it's kind of like giving it one last life or kind of giving it a purpose to also let go of it and, and, and move on from the object. Um, so that kind of just gives like a little context of how I was working with these materials. And then in a lot of these works at this time, I'll, sh I'll show you a few, I was doing live performances that um, also was with my parents. And that also is a, a bit um, of an unusual but, but amazing experience. My, um, my parents had no relationship to art. My dad is a, um, and still is, a, he, he's a businessman. He works um, in paper sales. It's like the office, um, strangely, a person who really, really does that. Um, and my mom, she uh, was a school teacher. So I um, began somehow, uh, while I was in grad school, incorporating them into my work, and it kind of grew into these live performances. This was a performance here where I found this old 100-year-old um, display case, 
and I gutted all the interior of it and was able to kind of contort my body into it. And then I would stay, um, every week I would do a performance for three hours where I would just sit there entirely still and stare straight ahead. And then that's my father in sort of this kind of painter's uniform. And he, for three hours, would just hold this grip bar and stare at me. So it's kind of like three hours oh of this. Um, and, um, and it was really a kind of a surreal experience because when you'd enter the space in the perform, you almost wouldn't see the performance. I was really interested in the idea of the performance as sculpture um, that people would enter and then often like walk through the objects and then see us and kind of get startled and jump back and we wouldn't interact with the audience. People would always be like, are you real? Or it would always be like strange conversations. People would say like, well, the man in the box is real, but the other one is made of wax. <laughs> so my, my, my dad's very convinced, very good at not moving. Uh, and I remember at the opening, because it's such a narrow space, people kind of had the single file walk on the right, and then like everyone would get, someone would get to the front, and they would see the performance and kind of like look at us and nod, and then they would like turn around and leave. So my dad's like, oh, it was like our funeral. Um, <laughs> So, um, and then for this piece, a lot of the works, or most of them had my mom in them as well. She, um, for this piece, wouldn't be in the performance because, um, I don't know if anyone here has been to Sculpture Center, but it has um, an upper level and a lower level, and the lower level is below ground, so it's kind of very damp, and my mom was adamant that she's like, I don't like to be in damp spaces. So. The uh, Sculpture Center was gracious enough to allow her to be the, the, the gallery sitter, the front desk woman, <laughs> um, during the performance. So we performed every Sunday for like three or four months, and my mom would sit the front desk. Um, and it was it's also a very surreal thing, because people would come in, and she'd be like, and people would always say like, um, it would also be a day where the performance was not advertised. I mean, we happened at, happened at the opening, but then on the Sunday, it just kind of people would stumble upon it, and they would come to the desk and say, like, can I ask you about the performance downstairs? And she'd say, of course, that's my son and my husband. <laughs> so it was like really this kind of weird extension, and she met all these like amazing people in, in, in the art world and would like talk to them. Um, so um, and I'll show you a few other, a few other images, but, but, but I like this idea with the works too, where they're performative and sculptural, but they also blur the boundaries between real life and performance. You know, when she was at the front desk, she was performing, but she also was just being herself. And she was also kind of working for the gallery in a strange way because she'd be like answering the phone so <laughs> it's this idea where like there's kind of a blurred area where the performance begins and ends and, and that really fascinates me um i remember we did a performance in brooklyn where she left to get coffee someone said to me after i saw your mom getting coffee down the street during the performance i was like well that was part of the performance <laughs> um, and then these are just some details of the installation Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's um, it's actually um, a really, really amazing building. It's um, an old um, trolley repair factory. So the main space is all brick, and it has um, oh god, I don't know, like sixty foot ceilings. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, and uh, they actually, if you ever go, it's a really amazing space. They still have the chains in the ceiling where the trolleys would be raised up, so you could work on them underneath. And then they had a lower level, which is kind of like um, these, almost like tunnels. Um, and they would always commission artists to do installations in this space. So it was really raw. Um, but even upstairs was still pretty raw, because it was like an old factory. Um, so here's another, I'll just go through this one quickly. This was another uh, performance. Um, this one was inspired by, um, there's this uh, landscape in New Jersey called the Meadowlands, which is like a, kind of a wasteland that um, for a long time, gar it was a garbage dump. Um, before that, it was like a recreation nature area. Um, 
people know it. If you ever watch a mob movie and they're dumping a body, it's always the Meadowlands. Like any mafia movie, they're always, so it's a landscape I'm really fascinated with. So I built this, this work that was it's a, a lot of objects I found in the Meadowlands. Um, and then I did this kind of tableau in the middle of it where again, we would do a, a three hour performance or this one was actually two hours and we would do it every week for um, I think six or seven weeks. And um, my mom would um, every week bring a chair from her um, backyard and sit on it. So again, this idea where like she would sit in the performance and read and be sculptural, but she's bringing the chair with her. So it's idea that kind of extends back to her real life. And um, you can't really, um, if you almost can see something here, then you go to the next slide. And my dad was in full <laughs> camo, kind of just staring out. And so again, um, and I was in this little kind of netted cage and I have this pellet gun that's dangling uh, from ropes right above my hand. Um, and this is a, a, an earlier one, one of the first ones actually, I thought just again to show it for some context um, of kind of the works evolved into these large site specific installations, but they began, um, I don't want to say simpler, but maybe a little more minimal. Um, this is actually my, my, um, my thesis show in grad school at Hunter College. And um, I basically um, had 2,000 pounds of um, aluminum condensers. It's like a cooling device crushed into a cube. And I was thinking a lot about, um, there was these commercials at the time, and I think they're still on TV today, where like a husband buys his wife a new car for Christmas and there's like a giant bow on top. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ordered one of those, I found where those bows are made, and I ordered one for this, and I kind of thought, it's just a, like an ambiguous sculptural object, but we would do this performance twice a week, where um, I would lean over it and hold a, a wheel, and I'd have all these kind of burn and bruises, and it sort of then transforms into a car, you know, this idea that it's, it's not a car, but it kind of becomes a car via the performance. Uh, and be, be a, uh, via my action. And then my mom was holding a smaller present. And my dad is kind of this firefighter putting out the fire, but strangely he has a, a garden hose. So it's kind of, it's a bit futile maybe. Um, and then this is another performance I just want to mention briefly uh, for the next work. This was a work um, I had done in, in, um, in Manhattan. And the work, um, kind of working in similar vein as to the, the other um, performances I, I showed and installations, this I had this, um, this structure built where if you see um, there's these industrial fans in here and they're, you can't really see so well from this image and they're blowing um, old US currency around me as I kind of stand in this, uh, in, this in this case. And I actually did this performance for I think five days a week for five weeks, so it was really, it really was hell. Like my days of doing like 40 hour a week performances, it's like the worst full-time job ever. Um, but the reason I mentioned this piece is, it was about a lot of different things, um, but I was holding in it this Philip Roth novel, and it was a really small detail in the, um, in the, in the work. Uh, I, I chose Roth because um, he's from New Jersey like I am, and I reference New Jersey a lot. Um, he deals with some similar subject matter like sports and, um, and um, like Americana and family. So I just had a friend who said, you should hold a Roth novel to piece. And I was like, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Um, and I chose his worst novel, by the way. So I thought, like, if I'm going to hold one, this is the one that everyone is like, this novel sucks. Like, this was his big failure. Um, and I found, like, a first edition of it and everything. So the reason I mention his piece is um, his attorneys, he's deceased now, but um, he sent like an army of attorneys to the opening and they, ser they tried to serve me while I was like 12 feet up, oh um, like uh, cease and desist. And he tried um, then to like file an injunction and sue me saying that I'm not allowed to hold his book in public, which is like a crazy lawsuit. Um, <laughs> And so, um, I mean, he lost, I mean, there was, eventually he dropped the charges because he was like, you don't have, you don't have, you never got my permission to hold my book. 
and it was I had an attorney and he's like it's crazy because like what about the person on the subway reading a book did, yeah. like do they need permission because he was saying you can't hold my book in public without my permission so the my lawyer is like had said you know if he actually won this case like people would have to put like a brown bag over their books when they're sitting in the park so um it was this crazy thing and there's more to the story i mean there's more just like absurdity uh, that i won't really get that i had a friend who knew him loosely and some people said like oh maybe it's just like his lawyers or whatever and they were and i had found out like he just was really angry and he's like i never gave this artist permission to hold my book so he just really was very um i mean he was very controlling of his name and image uh but this became a, a very absurd thing so i did um a, after after the legal battle ended i did um a, res, a response piece called the, the philip roth presidential library <laughs> and it was a series of um 14 foot tall columns and each column um had um, hundreds of Philip Roth books that were embedded in it. So it's kind of like the idea to like, well, on one hand, I was trying to get sued again because like being sued was kind of, um, well, I guess it was unfortunate, but also kind of an interest. I, I never really felt like I was at that much risk, um, but it was, it was really interesting because like I was saying before, I, 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 I'm very fascinated by how real life and art can sort of blend where they meet. So that work with Philip Roth, I was never interested in making work about Philip Roth, but then that became like something that I was known for. It was like, you're the artist who battles Philip Roth. And I'm like, <laughs> wasn't my intent. So then I just was like, I guess I'll just embrace it. So I had come up with this idea that I wanted to get sued again. And <laughs> it took a while, like every like gallery that I worked with was like, we don't want to do this project. And then there's a really great organization in, in Miami, I did it, um, at um, this gallery called Locust Projects. And they were really enthused. They were like, we have three lawyers on our board. So we're like ready to go to battle with him. Um, so the idea was to build um, a work that like in some strange way celebrates him, but also criticizes him. You know, it's kind of like a brain, I mean, he's a very, I mean, he's, He's, he's passed away now, but he, hit, he was this kind of megalomaniac. So in one way, I'm like, here's your library, you know, dedicated to you. But in another way, it's kind of an underhanded criticism about his ego. Um, and so I like that ambiguity. And I had like a reading area and um, you can't really see here, but I had like, like um, there's um, here, there's like a every good library has like a bust. Uh, so I, I, I had the 3D model of his face and then made a bust. <laughs> Um, and then some other works that were inspired by him. And um, sadly, he never, he never sued me. So I guess he didn't. I was trying to bait him, um, and um, that didn't work. But I was really happy with the work. And I think with, with the direction a lot of my work has gone, I became more and more interested in um, architecture and um, really responding to a space. Um, like with this space, for example, um, it is interesting that Locust Projects was saying, you know, when we, when we, when um, I had site visits down there, they were saying, you know, one thing people always dislike about our space is we have these um, three columns in the middle of you could see you could see one here, and they were like, so so many artists try to hide them or build s sculpture around it. So I sort of loved the idea that I would not try to hide the thing that people are frustrated with when they use the space, but almost to like draw attention to it. So I, so I thought I'm gonna build like 14 more columns <laughs> to kind of make it like super columny. Um, and this is a form I've actually then continued to work with for an, a number of years. And I think it deals with some of the same ideas I've been dealing with previously. Like I'm really interested in architecture, um, these ideas of like, you know, maybe like what lies beneath the surface, both metaphorically but also literally like this idea of like punching through drywall and like there's something in the walls but it's not a treasure it's just philip roth novels
this is something I also work a lot with these wallpapers. And um, I don't, I'm probably not going to get into it today, but I do a lot of um, photographs that are of built tableaus, and I work a lot with wallpapers and material and texture. Um, and so this is another, uh, it was a fun project that I thought I would share. Um, this was an outdoor work um, that was in um, Queens, New York. And uh, I was invited to do a project for this sculpture park. It's called Socrates Sculpture Park. And um, I did research and I learned that the actor Christopher Walken grew up like two blocks from the park. So I thought like, okay, this is the perfect thing to address. So I, um, <laughs> I, I, I created, I, I, I um, using a 3D modeling software and made a, a prototype of um, a Christopher Walken head that's sort of like a mushroom. <laughs> I'm also really fascinated by mushrooms. I have a video at the end, we can, if we have time we can watch it. Um, and so the idea was like you would walk through the park and there would be like Christopher Walken heads sprouting up everywhere. Um, and as if like his DNA had gotten into the soil or something. Um, and people, you know, it's really strange because like I just thought like it's interesting. I think he's um, an interesting actor. I actually had once went to a party and I'm not sure why, but he was at it. And I, 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 I asked him to take a photo and he was really, he was really pissed. And then he's like, yeah, but then I'm going to leave because he's like, I don't like, he, he's kind of curmudgeon-y. Uh, like Philip Roth, I, don't, I always, I always, so he's like, then I'm going to leave. I hate when people want to take my picture. And I put like my arm around him and cheers them. So I have this amazing photo where I'm like raising up a glass of whiskey and He's like looking at the ground real annoyed. So I think I had that also in my, in my head. And, um, but it's really funny, like people, you know, it, it's interesting. It makes me think a lot about, about like art and its relationship to audience because I didn't know what happens when you make a work about a real cult figure, but <laughs> New York and kind of like, the, like a lot of places went crazy and I was at the time um, living in Europe, and so I installed the piece. There was like an opening, and then like I got on a, fl a plane to Stockholm, and I got off the flight, and I got home, and I opened my email, I had like 4,000 emails, and it was like, do you want to be on this reality TV show on MTV? Like, it was just like crazy stuff started like coming my way that had no relation to me or my art or anything, but the public really loves Christopher Walken, I learned. And um, people like, like I would, people would like tell me, I mean, it was funny because I'm like in Sweden, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And people would be like texting me and be like, tonight on the nightly news, they did the weather from your sculpture. So like it became this real New York thing. And um, I wish I had a photo of it, but like three years later or so, I moved back to New York. And then there was like, a billboard by the city, and it was like, fun New York facts, and it was like a thing, and it would always say something like, I don't know, the, the like, something like the, the, I don't know, the seventh mayor of New York had only eight fingers or something, it always had some like fun weird fact, and there was a giant one, and, no, and I was like walking down the street, and it's like, there was a Christopher Walken, Walken mushroom sculpture spread all around Queens. So I was like, oh, look, I'm a, I'm a fun fact. <laughs> so, but it has like no relation to me, which is also interesting, I think, as an artist. Like, it's not like my name's in it. And I kind of like that in a way. It kind of just became part of a, a public discourse. Um, and then just um, this last one, it's actually just a work I just installed before I came here. So I thought I would share it. Um, I was um, invited to create a uh, public work for um, actually the, ta the town um, I was born in, in New Jersey. And um, I did a lot of, um, when I was really young, we, we moved, we moved uh, a few towns away. So I didn't know so much about this town's history, but I did a lot of research and um, I learned that the town has um, a really amazing history of um, Syrian and Armenian immigrants coming there a hundred years ago, or a little more, 120 years ago, to um, work in these silk factories. And I thought it was really um, this fascinating history because the I was working with, um, the town has a few people that are helping commission works there, but the town has become really stuffy and actually quite conservative. 
Um, and it's, so the com people on the, the sculpture commission and myself are really interested in kind of bringing attention to not just like the diversity of the town, but kind of this like, you know, it's kind of this town that's just like has become very wealthy, all these people from Wall Street live there, kind of stuffy, conservative. I mean, um, New Jersey's not the most progressive place in the world, but it's generally more to the left, and this town is not. So I was really interested in like drawing some attention of like what this place was. So um, I was able to work with these archives in the town and pull up all these amazing images um, of these immigrant families coming there. And there were also um, communities. There was a neighborhood, uh, it was called the Neighborhood House, um, where a lot of them would go and learn English and their children would study and they would learn silk making and work in all these factories. And kind of um, the idea, so the work had like, um, I just wanted to make something very kind of formal, these two sculptures that stand in the park. And also thinking a lot about, um, um, actually being, being out west now, um, I think it was late last year that there was that weird monolith in the desert. I think it was in Utah. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought it'd be fun to be like, I mean, this town summit is like nothing goes on there. It's like the sleepy, I mean, it's cute, but it's the sleepiest place, you know, that you could imagine. So I was like, now summit has its own enigmatic monolith. So the idea was that like you kind of approach these from a distance and they're almost very formal and clean. And then when you get up close, there's kind of all this context with like archival imagery and text and images of silk making in the town and the immigrants coming over. Um, but I was also really careful. I didn't, I didn't want to make the work too didactic and too much um, um, like a historical marker. So I wanted to leave it also a little open-ended. Uh, but it was a really great experience and I loved working with the town and the people there. And it's, um, it's, been, and it's been received quite well, so I'm happy about that. Um, and it kind of just bring, I think it's interesting because I've worked so much in the past with my own family. I, I don't really do performances uh, with my family anymore. I kind of retired that part of my practice, but it's interesting to see how other sort of family and historical narratives kind of now enter into my work. work. Um, and then if um, I have um, a short video, do we have, are, we have, are we okay on time? Or? Um, let me see if it's, maybe we get it right here. Let's see if this loads. If not, I can grab it all. That folder's on the desktop, Ryan. Oh, that'll be, that, that might, might be yeah, let me see. Is it at this one? Maybe I can just load it. Let me see if this loads. I mean, it's open now. Let's just see. Oh, maybe I will. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. It's just right here. Oh, yeah. I saved the last one. Teaching at a second. Um, so I thought to just, you know, um, to wrap up the talk, I could show this is, um, and if any people know R21, they, they document um, artists' work. And I've been very fortunate that they've been documenting my work for um, almost 10 years now. And this is the last, uh, probably the last, last film, because we've worked together a lot, um, that kind of was about. The film prior to this was like, Brian burnt out in New York. He's going to Sweden. And then I did, and I was like, bye, everyone. But then three years later, I'm like, I'm coming back. So R21 was like, they really only focus on usually New York, sometimes other places. So then I came back. They're like, now we can tell your story. Why would you come back? So um, it's a really fun film. It's short. It's only like six minutes long. So um, I thought I would share it. And it's pretty recent. It came out. Um, earlier in the pandemic, so maybe a little less than it, uh, a year ago or so, a year maybe ago. I'm ready to go. You're so ready to go? Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you want, whatever. No, no. I was teaching at a SUNY uh, college right outside of New York City, and there's a student who never showed up. No big deal. He shows up in my afternoon class, and he's like, I just need you to sign this form 
to say that you're going to allow me to drop the class. And I said, yeah, you haven't been here all semester. I'm not going to drop you on the last day. You failed my class. He says, sign the form. I, I said, they're like, this isn't even your class. Like, I'm teaching. So there's like 20 students like watching this. Then he kind of gets like in my face more. So at some moment, I had to stand up and he chest bumps me. But he like kind of throws me into the wall and he's like, sign the damn form. So he does one of these like, and knocks everything off my desk. And he's like, you're not a real teacher. You're an art teacher. You all suck. Art sucks. I failed. I failed. <laughs> some fantasy of being an artist in New York. To some degree, I feel that I'm living that, that fantasy. I get to be